this is one of those threshold issues that, you know, it's worthwhile to make that determination and get the advice because if you don't think FMLA applies to you, but it does, you're going to be committing violation after violation until someone, you know, makes a complaint to the DOL or files a lawsuit. Yeah. So better to know what, you know, what you have to deal with now than, you know, risk that type of exposure. Welcome to Mission to Grow, the small business guide to cash, compliance, and the war for talent. I'm your host, Mike Vinoy. Each week, we'll bring you experts in accounting, finance, human resources, benefits, employment law, and more. You'll learn ways to access capital through creative financing and tax strategies, tactical information you need to stay compliant with ever-changing employment laws, and people strategies you need to win the war for talent. Mission to Grow is sponsored by Assure. Assure helps more than 100,000 businesses get access to capital, stay compliant, and develop the talent they need to grow. Enjoy the show. FMLA, what every business needs to know about the Family Medical Leave Act. Hi, I'm Mike Vinoy, your host of Mission to Grow, and uh, I got a great guest today to unpack this pretty technical, legalistic topic. Um, I guess to his extensive experience defending class and collective action lawsuits against federal and state wage and hour laws. His practice focuses on representing employers in a wide range of workplace matters, as well as preventative advice and counseling. He has successfully defended wage and hour audits conducted by the U.S. and New York State Departments of Labor, and he regularly handles cases before courts and administrative agencies involving claims of discrimination, sexual harassment, and retaliation. Please welcome back to the show, Brian Schenker, principal at Jackson Lewis. Welcome, Brian. Thank you, Mike. So let's start out. Uh, not everybody knows what FMLA is. If you're a bigger company, uh, you, you, you probably do. Uh, let's first start to start out. What, what what is the definition of FMLA, LA, the Family Medical Leave Act, and, and maybe a little bit of how it came to be? Yeah. Uh, so the FMLA is one of the uh, the newer federal statutes. It was only passed uh, back in 1993, uh, and so real high level, the FMLA allows qualified employees to take up to 12 weeks of unpaid job protected leave. Uh, each year for either their own medical reasons or to care for a sick family member, as well as some other reasons. Uh, and once that period ends, uh, the leave period ends, the employee must be returned to uh, the same job uh, as he or she previously held or a virtually identical uh, position. Uh, and so really, you know, back when this was passed, uh, you know, Bill Clinton was, was president and, you know, the idea was that, you know, when workers are not given leave to deal with these important issues, uh, that it then kind of everyone else bears the cost, right? Because these people either leave their job or, you know, take other measures. And so um, it's one of those statutes that is used quite a lot. Um, I think that back in 2018, there was a survey that said, uh, roughly 15% of employees had taken FMLA leave in the prior 12 months. Um, so mm -hmm. you know, that's a real indicator that this is something that's utilized by employees and is something that employers certainly need to know uh, how, to, how to handle requests and uh, you know, how they go from you know, the, the notice that there might be a need for leave to all the way to returning them back to their position. So uh, we'll talk about kind of all what I'll call the spinoffs of, of, of FMLA at the state and, and local level in a bit. But what is it that growing companies really need to understand about FMLA? Because it, it's, it's, this doesn't apply to all companies. It's really small emerging companies that are going to hit a certain threshold here, right? Right, exactly. So, uh, you know, we can discuss that in a moment, but generally 50 employees within a 75 mile radius of the work site uh, will trigger employer coverage. Um, but, you know, look, I, I think that, yeah, as you mentioned, there are lots of steps involved in the FMLA process where employee employers can get tripped up. Uh, but, you know, I think one thing I would convey to, uh, you know, employers that may be, you know, either on the precipice of, you uh, you know, being subject to this uh, law or, you know, some that, you know, recently have been is that FMLA 
leave is not as complicated as many people you know might say it is. Now, obviously, there are complexities, there are nuances, uh, but really, you know, some proactive steps by an employer to get the right notices in place, get the right policy in place. And then you're really just following your steps every time. Uh, and so I, I think this can be made a bit straightforward. Obviously, I think that's our goal today to unpack this uh, in a very straightforward way for companies. Um, but I, I think in many of the, uh, uh, the, the mess ups, so to say, that, that I typically see from employers are easily preventable. Uh, you know, if they had policies, if they had, you know, done a little bit of investment in the, you know, proactive uh, compliance, uh, most FMLA violations uh, can be avoided. So for, first to start out, um, and, and it varies the, the different permeations this takes at the state level, but it is a federal law, a singular federal law, FMLA, uh, in, the, in, the, in the cutoff point here is 50 employees. So um, a, a lot of smaller companies that this doesn't apply to you yet, but uh, as the name of this show, Mission to Grow uh, implies, you're trying to provide HR information, uh, HR compliance information for growing firms. So aspiring to break that 50 employee mark. Can you maybe talk about, let, let, so, so let's back up before we talk about more technicalities. So you talked about like a 75 mile radius. I think we need to talk about uh, what is a full-time equivalent. And there's, there's some parameters there. Just, just maybe back up. But what was the intent of the law? Where were we in 1993 that really drove uh, to, to to this place? Yeah. So I think what really you know was happening was that you know employees you know prior to FMLA there there was no unpaid leave for serious issues, right? Either the employee you know if the employee themselves got injured or had some medical condition. Of course, there's the Americans with Disabilities Act. But what about if, you know, someone's spouse uh, has a serious medical condition and uh, the employee needs to provide care for them or, or care for a newborn child? Yeah. Uh, there is nothing on the books that uh, really allowed employees to take any leave for those types of things. And that became a problem because uh, you know, it left employees with a real tough decision to make, uh, you know, when they had to take those leaves. It was, you know, do I stay at my job and not able to offer help to, you know, those who may need it or, you know, or whatnot? Or do I quit my job and, you know, go do that? And now that has an impact on the employer too, right? It's not just an impact on the employee. Now they don't have a job. The employer now needs to go find someone. So, you know, it, in light of those types of issues, uh, that that's kind of how the FMLA came about. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, you've talked about, you know, state laws and such, and, you know, we've kind of seen a, um, an evolution, I guess you could say, right? So right. roughly 30 years ago, FMLA comes about. And as we said, this is job protected leave, but it's unpaid, right? Right. And so and, and that's really key. And I want to hit on one thing before you, we start going to the end of the evolution, maybe, Ryan. I'd say if you think about the continuum of federal HR laws going back to the Fair Labor Standard, Standards Act, you know, 1938, and then uh, Equal Pay and Civil Rights Act of, uh, Acts of the 60s to then uh, Safe Work Environment, OSHA of the 70s, Americans with Disabilities, early 90s. And here, here comes... FMLA early '90s, the idea was how do we how do we continue to give more protection, more services to employees? So uh, very slowly, the, the the continuum of power shifting from employer to employee and more protections for employees. But this wasn't meant to p punish small businesses, right? Um, it, and it wasn't meant to be paid. It was really a job protection for. Uh, just what you said, you know, you got a sick child, you got an elderly parent, you have what, whatever, and we'll talk about the qualifying uh, events, whatever your qualifying event is, that you may not get paid for it, but you're, you were at least protected the, to not lose your job. I, I'm saying that right, right? Right, right. Yeah, okay. Um, and so from there, we start to evolve into 
different permeations at the state levels where sometimes this is now morphing into, I know it's morphing into paid leave in some cases. Uh, does the does the rule of 50 employees also change state by state? Yeah, so I, I think what we see in, in the states is that, you know, various states, you know, in the past, right, implemented uh, some similar, you know, unpaid leave laws. And then now in the last, I don't know, say five years or, or maybe even less than that, Mike, right, we've seen a lot of these uh, paid leave laws, which I think are really the next evolution from FMLA. And, you know, FMLA really set the stage for that. Right. Uh, you know, there has been discussion, uh, some proposals at the federal level uh, about, you know, some paid aspect to FMLA. We haven't seen that come about yet. And, you know, I don't want to uh, frighten any of our viewers that it's, you know, on, you know, coming down the pike right now. Uh, it really it may not, because really we've seen states and localities, you know, fill that gap where they've seen. All right, great. Employees do need these uh, uh, this type of leave, but now we want to compensate them at some level for that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so state laws and local laws have, have filled that gap. But um, you know, those laws also tend to apply to smaller employers as well. Uh, so you know, I, I think it's it's key to understand for employers that look simply because you might not have fifty employees does not mean the idea of medical leave right. for your workers should be some foreign concept, right? I mean, some states it, that may be, but, you know. And ironically, that's why I kind of wanted to like take that on the, at the top of the conversation here, because to be clear, we're going to unpack the details of FMLA, the singular law, Family Medical Leave Act, federal law, under 50 employees uh, in its unpaid, but it's important for employers to understand the continuum here, right? Um, between between the, the the labor shortage and the supply and demand of labor and just this, I'll call it going on a 80, 90 year trend of laws on the books that increasingly give protections and services to employees and put a bigger burden on employers. Yeah, you got to comply with FMLA. But you need to understand the, the the bigger story, what's really unfolding here. And as you as you plan and you create budgets and you build a strategy to to, to build a great team, um, th this is this is something that's part of the fabric of our culture. That is this is a sea change that is happening, right? It's not just the federal laws. Uh, uh, this is this is moving down market into smaller firms. It is turning from unpaid into paid in some cases. Um, but 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 that's the that's the that's the sea change that's happening here, right? Yeah, exactly. And so, um, you know, obviously, from a compliance standpoint, right? You, you first uh, you, you need to comply with you know the most restrictive of laws, right? So, uh, I think a good parallel to this would be you know since the Depart U.S. Department of Labor oversees both the FMLA and the Fair Labor Standards Act, I think that's a good parallel to draw, right? Where we always say that. The FLSA sets the floor for, say, minimum wage, right? But states can go, you know, above that and, you know, impose a $15 minimum wage, right? Just like here, you know, the FMLA sets the floor, right? But if you're in a jurisdiction with something that requires more, you will need to comply with both laws. And so, you know, that is where, you know, things can get a little uh, tricky from time to time when, when you're dealing with, you know, multiple leave laws. And I, I think we'll discuss a little of that today. There's certainly, um, you know, some overlap and interaction between the FMLA and uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, employers should be on the lookout for their state laws that that might require something more. All right. So, so we know it. It's a, the FMLA is a law of the past in 93. We talked about the continuum, the sea change of uh, more uh, the HR laws continue to go on the books, leaning, putting more burden on employers, giving more services, freedoms, uh, uh, whatever you want, how you ever want to describe it to employees. Let's kind of step it back and just talk FMLA. So uh, let, let's unpack this. You, you said it's simpler than people realize. Take us through the, 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 the legal components here. 
whom, what businesses must comply, what are the rules that they have to follow. Great. So yeah, that, that, that's jump, dive right in, right? So for employers, uh, you know, you, you need to decide, figure out as a threshold matter, does this statute apply to me? Uh, so really, if if a company has employed 50 employees or more in the current year or the preceding year, that essentially means that you're covered right now by the FMLA. Um, you know, basically, the, the exact requirement is that the company needs to have at least uh, 50 employees for 20 or more uh, calendar weeks uh, in a year uh, in order to uh, be, be covered. So if that occurs either in the current year or the previous year, you're in. Uh, and employees, you know, this isn't um, as complicated, say, as, uh, um, you know, uh, some other statutes and how we count people. Um, we're counting all, you know, part-time and full-time employees uh, who are within, you know, that uh, 75 miles uh, of a work site, or the, the 75 mile radius of that work site. So yeah. again, if, if you're a company with, you know, 25 employees at one work site and 25 at another, you know, the, the factor that's going to determine whether you're subject to this law is what's the distance between those two work sites. If it's more than. So Brian, I, I don't, all these years, I don't think I, I don't, I'd forgotten that component. So could I be, could I be a firm that has 49 employees at a hundred locations, but they're all more than 75 miles apart. That means I am not compelled by FMLA. Right. Yeah. There, there is unlike many of the other statutes, there is this geographical uh, requirement. Yeah. Yeah. Which makes sense because if you think about the reason they drew the line, it's, it's, it's an undue burden to put on a small business owner, right? So if you're, if you're a single location business, Forget if you're brick and mortar retailer, your business services, whatever your business is. If you've only got 10 employees, if one of your people leave for six months it might be for a, a totally valid reason and you love them and you care for them and you support the reason that they had to take leave, you still have a business to run and, and you can't just not go without backfilling that person. Basically, the law says, hey, we understand small businesses, you don't have enough people to account for. But if you have more than 50 people, I guess, at a location, uh, if you have fewer than 50 people, it's like, okay, you might have, you might be a bigger firm and locations all around, but it's unreasonable for people to drive more than 75 miles to offset the temporary absence of that one person. Am I, am I thinking about that right? Yeah, I, I think that's, you know, part of, part of that reason, right? Because a lot of this is going to require, you know, uh, replacement employees or, you know, cross training employees to handle someone else's duties yeah. or, you know, bring on someone else. So, yeah, I think the idea was we're only going to apply this to employers that are deemed large enough to deal with those issues. And um, is it it's W-2 true employees? This is not 1099 freelancers or contractors, right? Right. I, I mean, provided those classifications are correct, right? If you have misclassified employees, yeah. that could that could be an issue. And we have a bunch of podcasts on exactly that topic. So the proper proper classification, according to uh, FLSA, is is the first step. Um, how about full time equivalency? Do do these fifty employees need to be pass any full time equivalency test? No. So there's no equivalency test here. It's you know you count uh, full time employees, part time employees, the same and you know, if you get to, uh, you know, 50, I mean, really, the, the, the easy way to do it is look at payroll, right? If in any month you have over or any week, rather, you have over 50 people that are, you know, receiving, uh, you know, pay or otherwise on payroll, then that that's going to get you over the hump. Now you have to be above that for, you know, 20 weeks, not consecutive. It could be any 20 weeks uh, in that year. But uh, but yeah, we're, we're going to count basically, you know, all, all our employees the same uh, with respect to this one. So this is something I think uh, sometimes people will kind of accidentally commingle laws. Family Medical Leave Act and the Affordable Care Act, ACA. Both have 50 employees, but it's different. So and we're not going to do an uh, Affordable Care Act and ACA uh, that lesson here. But 
also a trigger of 50 employees, but there's a full-time equivalency there for family medical leave. This is not 50 full-timers. This is 50 people that you have on the payroll, even if they're part-time staff, correct? Yeah. Correct. Really, and, really, really important. Yeah. And I, I think one other issue for uh, companies to look out for is that like many of the statutes, uh, there are joint employer uh, issues, right? So even if your business is under 50, you may be deemed to be a joint employer with another company and then aggregated the two companies hit that 50. So, uh, you know, that we, we that, that's a whole nother uh, deep dive. But really what it often comes down to is, you know, does your company or does another company, you know, have control over a different company's employees? That's probably an edge case. We don't need to go too deep down that rabbit hole. But is it is it fair to say, so this is this is entity aggregation. So maybe I have maybe I have three dry cleaners all in town less than five miles they're five and ten miles apart. Um un, but for tax reasons, liability reasons, I have all three of those set up as their own LLC. Um so three separate legal entities, but me as a single owner of those, I would, the, the law would say I, I aggregate those as, as one, correct? Yeah, very likely that even though it's different, you know, corporate entities, it'll all be considered one employer. Yeah. Is it also safe to say, and maybe that maybe I'm going on a limb here, but if it's a completely different line of business, like maybe, maybe I own some, uh, some, some dry cleaners, but I also own a, a construction company in town. Those employees, you know, they're, they're not cross trained to do each other's job. If it's, but I'm still a common owner. Does does the does the same fifty rule, fifty employee aggregation rule apply there? So it would be much less likely that those would be considered joint employers. Uh, you know, obviously, when they're in different lines of business, we would imagine there's going to be less control of one company over another company's workers because they're doing something different. Um, we would we would probably not see employees being transferred between those companies because, again, they're doing something different. So, yeah, yeah most likely in that scenario, uh, you're, you're looking at, you know, uh, separate companies that are not going to be aggregated. So if you're an entrepreneur, you're a business owner, you're watching today, you're listening today and you've got a dry cleaning business, you've got hair salons, you've got a small construction business. And you've got a real estate property business. You're 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 an entrepreneur. You got a bunch of different irons in the fire, like many people do. Um, if they're really discrete lines of business, LLC entity structure almost doesn't matter. You're still the the single owner. If they're separate legal structures and separate lines of business that don't commingle employees, you're probably safe. But if you get too big and you ever have any crossover of any employees. You should probably be getting a legal opinion here, right? Yeah, certainly. Because look, this is one of those threshold issues that, you know, it's worthwhile to make that determination and get the advice because if you don't think FMLA applies to you, but it does, you're going to be committing violation after violation until someone, you know, makes a complaint to the DOL or files a lawsuit. Yeah. So better to know what, you know, what you have to deal with now than, you know, risk that type of exposure. And it's maybe not the majority of people watching or listening today, but th th there, are, there are plenty of entrepreneurs with, you know, completely different lines of business. And I can imagine this scenario. I've got one, one maintenance guy from this, you know, maybe the businesses are completely separate, but for one person who is maintenance oriented, they're handy. Oh, I'll just go over here and have them fix the the plumbing issue in this other business. Now you've co-mangled employees. You may be opening yourself up. I, I would, I would really emphasize for folks if if that's you, get a legal opinion whether you uh, 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 must or comply with FMLA or not. Okay. Um, anything else on what companies must comply? So it's fifty employees. It's W twos. It's not freelancers. It's not ten ninety nine ninety nine folks. Um, it doesn't matter full time, part time, as long as they're within a 75 mile radius. That's it. You must comply. Right. Yep. Yep. So and that's really it. It's, it's pretty simple on, on the employer side to, to make that determination. And now on the employee side, mm -hmm. what are there are criteria that must be met for an employee to then take FMLA. Right. 
Sure. Yep. So there are a couple uh, requirements for the employee to be eligible. Uh, the first one is that the employee needs to have been employed by the company for at least 12 months. Uh, the months of service are determined uh, when the leave is scheduled to begin, not when the request is made. Uh, okay. So that's measured from the first day of work up, up through the date the leave is supposed to begin. Uh, it need not be consecutive 12 months, right? There could be you know some gaps in there, but we're talking about 12 uh, working months. So essentially, if an employee is on payroll for you know any part of a week, um, th then they're essentially uh, counted for that entire week as being employed by the company. Okay. Uh, so that, that's the first requirement, 12 months. Uh, then in addition to that, the employee needs to have worked 1250 hours uh, in the last uh, 12 months. Um, so again, we're talking about uh, compensable hours, right? So, uh, you know, you heard me reference the F FLSA earlier and, and I'll do it again here because the FMLA and FLSA have some things in common. There are some uh, similar uh, you know, definitions. And so what we're looking at is 1250 hours of compensable work time. So, you know, leave would not other types of leave or PTO would not necessarily be included in that. It's actual compensable work time. So that's yeah, very simple. You can look at payroll. Now, that's easy enough for a non-exempt employee, right? Someone who's being paid an hourly rate. Um, but look, we also have exempt individuals uh, who will request FMLA leave. And how do we determine that, right? Because we're not tracking salaried workers' hours typically. Um, mm -hmm. So basically, the, the basic idea here is if you have an exempt employee who's worked for your company for the last 12 months, the presumption is, under the law is that they meet the 1,250 hours. Um, yeah. And so, again, you know, the problem in our, for our employer arguing that an exempt employee does not meet the 1,250 hours is that they won't have time records. So that's why the employer will not typically make that dispute as to employee eligibility for a salaried employee because it's very difficult for the employer to carry their burden to show this person did not work uh, 1,250 hours. So, right. you know, if it's anywhere close, you're going to err on the side that they met it for exempt employees. But for our non-exempt employees, you can go hour by hour. You know, if they miss 1,250 by 30 minutes, they've missed it, you know. So, um, you know, that it, when you have the time records, you can do that calculation. Uh, if it's an exempt employee, again, typically we're going to presume they, they meet uh, this requirement. And Brad, I talked earlier about a, a full-time equivalency calculation. So this is all W-2 employees, but the fact that there's that 1280 minimum hours worked, that kind of corrects for a, a, an employer who might have a concern, say, hey, I got this person, they, they only work, you know, they, they work Saturdays for me, right? They, 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 work, they work six hours every Saturday. Um, it, it, do I really have to protect their job for Right. If, if, they, if they leave, well, the answer would be no, because they would never approach that 1,280 hours, right? Exactly. And I, I think, don't quote me on this, my math might be a little fuzzy, but I, I think it's something around an average of 25 hours per week for the entire year that, that would get right. someone above this threshold. So yes, that's still somewhat of a part-time employee, but uh, it, it, this isn't going to be your, you know, your sporadic workers who are, you know, uh, if you just think a 40 hour work week times 52 weeks is 2080 hours. So 1280 is a little, little more than just half of that. So, you know, I mean, I think that's a good rule of thumb. Somebody who works a little bit more than half time is, is, is probably a good rule of thumb to be thinking about that. Right. That could be an eligible employee. Exactly. And, and that for that same reason, that's why when you look at it in those terms, you understand why most exempt employees who are working, you know, five days a week would would easily hit this number. Right. Um, right. And then look, the, the last requirement, I, we talked about this same requirement in terms of employer coverage, but it's also important for employee coverage that the employee works at a work site 
with at least 50 employees within a 75 mile uh, radius radius. Um, Say more about that. What, what would be what would be an example that maybe there's 50 employees at a work site, but they don't work at that work site Would that. Does that mean right. That? So, for instance, you know, something that's come up in, you know, much more in the last few years has been, uh, uh, you know, remote work or, or telework. Right. So, uh, you know, that can add a complication as to, you know, what work site are those employees, you know, working from in order to meet, you know, the, the 50s. So uh, in that example, you know, we're looking at whatever office the employee, the remote employee reports to or from which they receive their assignments. Um, you know, so, so again, you know, it goes back to the issue of you can have a company with, you know, less than 50 employees at, you know, various uh, work sites. Um, and, you know, it might not apply to them because of, you know, the locations of those sites being, you know, more than 75 miles away from each other. So again, this is just, again, to ensure that, it's only applying to employees who are at those sites with at least 50 employees within that 75 mile, uh, mile radius. How does that play for larger companies that increasingly have a large percent of their workforce is mostly virtual or at least flexible? That maybe, I mean, I'm sitting here in our Austin uh, uh, headquarters today. Um, the this is I, I, I usually work from my home office. There's a lot of people that come into this office for meetings and travel and they and they kind of co-locate here. Um, how should businesses be thinking about the 50 employee within 75 miles if most people are actually remote and they occasionally come together into a single space? Yeah. So I, I think in that case, it's not necessarily uh, the question of, you know, when they come, you know, very sporadically to whatever office, right? That might not be really what we're looking at. You know, we, we'd be looking at, you know, where are, where's your work coming from? Where are you being supervised? Um, and, and look, that, that could be complicated because that might, you know, have us, you know, pointing each employee in a different direction. But uh, again, that's something that a company should do, to, uh, you know, to make sure that, um, the employee is eligible. And again, we'll get to this, but this uh, this comes up, right? So you, you first really determine that you're an FMLA covered employer, right? So you know that you have to deal with FMLA, you're going to have a policy and uh, whatnot. This comes up when an employee comes to you and asks for you know some type of leave or you have noticed that they're seeking it. Now you need to determine if that employee is eligible for the leave, right? Mm -hmm. You're, you're, mm -hmm. You're a covered employer, but you need to determine, is this employee someone who's permitted to use uh, yeah. FMLA leave? So, right. um, you know, that, that's, that's when this determination would be made, most likely, when, when that employee is making that request. So it, it may not be that a company needs to figure this out for every employee now, right? You may know enough that, hey, we're, we're covered, but then, you know, we're going to have to see, you know, individual employees might be from you know, various offices that, that might not have coverage. And so, you know, you need to, you know, inquire into that when they make their request for leave. All right. So we talked about the, what companies in different configurations fall under FMLA. We talked about what employees are potentially eligible based on where they work and number of work hours. What are some of the specific criteria if they actually want to take leave? Sure. Uh, excellent, excellent question. So that is, you know, what what this is all about, right? So, um, you know, there's different types of qualifying leave, right? Um, and so the, the main the, the main couple are, you know, FMLA leave for an employee's own serious medical condition, right? That's often when this comes up that, you know, the employee needs to, you know, they're or rather they're unable to perform the functions of their job because of some medical issue. And that is often, you know, what triggers, uh, you know, a, a request. Um, yeah. Likewise, it could be uh, this serious medical condition of a family member, 
right? That's defined as a spouse, a child, uh, or a parent. Uh, and so, you know, taking care of a family member with a serious uh, health condition, uh, that's another uh, opportunity to take FMLA leave. Uh, there are several uh, leaves for uh, individuals in military or families with uh, individuals uh, in active military service uh, relating to exigencies, relating to, you know, uh, someone being called to active duty or impending duty. Um, and then uh, the, the other area is really the birth or adoption of a child, right? That uh, an employee can take time off for that, for that purposes to bond with or care for a, a new baby. Yeah. Um, and so again, re regardless of, you know, Generally, regardless of the type of leave, it's going to be 12 weeks. We won't get into it. There's, one, there's an exception for some type of uh, military leaves that can go beyond that. I, I, you know, we won't dive into that, uh, um, that hole today. But generally, regardless of the type of leave, it's going to be 12 weeks um, you know, for care of a baby, for instance. Uh, you know, that leave, you're only eligible for that between the date of birth and 12 months later. So you have that first year of, you know, a child's life when you can, you know, take that FMLA leave. Um, and, you know, uh, beyond that, you know, when, when we're talking about um, a serious uh, health condition, right, um, you know, that's an important thing for employers to understand what is a serious health condition. Because oftentimes, uh, one, you know, the, a big issue in, uh, determining if it's a qualifying leave is that the employee says they have some health condition. And now we need to figure out if that actually uh, subjects them to the FMLA and the ability to take FMLA leave. So, yeah. you know, a serious health condition is any illness or impairment. Uh, it could be a physical or mental uh, condition that either involves inpatient care or continuing treatment by a healthcare provider. Um, and so I think the general way that an employer can think of what type of health conditions are covered by the FMLA and, and what we're talking about for the, you know, for the employee is that the FMLA was not designed to cover, you know, ordinary everyday conditions, right? Um, the common cold, the flu, earaches, uh, you know, upset stomach, um, minor headaches, you know, dental problems. You know, those those are not ser you know, serious uh, you know, health conditions. Um, you know, these things are, uh, again, right, I mean, on the more serious end, right, cancer, things like that, where you're going to have continuing treatment, but it can be less serious things that nonetheless require, you know, a stay in the hospital and some continued treatment thereafter. Yep. Um, and, and we'll discuss that, you know, once an employer is on notice uh, that an employee may need uh, a FMLA leave, uh, the employer then uh, needs to gather information to make this determination. So, you know, what typically occurs is that you get a medical certification uh, from an employee. Um, and then that that comes from their healthcare provider. And that certification provides information as to, you know, what the condition is, um, you know, treatment or limitations, right? You know, uh, oftentimes employer, you know, it's a good idea for employers to provide the medical provider a copy of the job description so that the medical provider can state, yep, they, you know, what they can do with respect to the, the job or, or not. Um, but yeah, you know, once we get that information, uh, you know, the employer needs to figure out, does this qualify as a health, a serious health condition? Uh, and they can request more information. You can get clarifying information from the medical uh, provider. Um, and you know, at, the employer needs to promptly make that determination as to whether this is going to be subject to FMLA leave. Brent, Brent in, your, in your practice, wh where, is, where is it? I, like, I got a bunch of questions I want to ask about edge cases, like what defines family members, step kids, step parent, yeah. 
uh, hey, it's a, it's not my it's an aunt, but she raised me. I mean, there's all kinds of kinds of edge cases here. But where are the places that you see employers get in trouble the most? What, what, what are the what are the cases that typically get, get litigated? Yeah. So what I often see is a complete failure by employers to begin treating it as an FMLA qualifying event. Right. And I, I say that, uh, let me clarify, right, that, you know, we often say with respect to the ADA and disability accommodations, there's no magic word. Right. And that's the same here. Right. An employee does not need to come in and say, you know, Mike, I'd like to take FMLA leave. Right. An employee may have no idea what FMLA leave is. Right. Let's not presume they actually read the handbook. Right. Uh, so. They of course, come, they, they just don't remember it. <laughs> that, 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 that's our, uh, right. That, because <laughs> you as an employer will have insisted, based on our best practices, that you have an updated handbook and you made sure that it was reviewed and signed off. But continue. Right. So they, they've acknowledged it, but we don't know what they remember. So, right. right. So the, the key is uh, that, you know, the company, and look, this is not just HR. This may involve some, you know, training of supervisors that, they need to understand when an employee is making a request for leave or uh, providing information that they do have a serious uh, health condition. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, it, it's so important for supervisors to, you know, push that information, you know, up towards HR uh, or whomever will be, you know, handling, uh, you know, FMLA or other leave management that, you know, when you get, you know, and, and again, there's there's no bright line test of what's enough information versus what's not enough information. So that that is why the key here is err on the side of caution, which means what? Which means if you think the employee has maybe possibly uh, divulged some information about a requested leave that that you know could potentially be covered by FMLA you give them the medical certification, right? You give them the documentation for them to fill out and get back because at that point, when the company gives them the certification, it's not, the company is not saying this is FMLA leave. We're beginning the process. You'll have FMLA leave. No, it's really an inquiry. It's saying, we're not sure if this is subject to FMLA. Here is a certification form. Have your provider complete it, get it back to us so that we can then determine if this is, uh, if this is leave. And, you know, the FMLA does impose the burden on the employee to provide the company with sufficient information to make that determination. But again, that doesn't mean the employer will be excused from, you know, seeking it, right? It's more an issue of if the company seeks out this information, right? Sends, gives the employee the medical certification form. And let's say the employee just doesn't turn, you know, return that form or otherwise just doesn't get back to the employer with additional information to make this cover, you know, uh, eligibility determination. Then the employer, again, you know, every case is different, right? But if, if they're, the employee is not getting the employer the information, then the employee will not be entitled to leave if, if the employer doesn't have that. So that's why it's important for companies to establish, you know, in writing with a document uh, that they are seeking information about this leave and whether it might qualify. I think like ICE enforces uh, uh, immigration law and your your I nines. I think uh, Department of Labor can do an audit on wage and hour laws. Um, EEOC for discrimination claim. How who enforces? FMLA, uh, is there an agency or do these things usually, if there's enforcement, it's usually more the result of just a lawsuit? So the De U.S. Department of Labor is the agency that oversees the FMLA. And okay. you've heard me reference the FLSA a few times, and that's because the DOL manage, you know, oversees you know, uh, both statutes. Uh, and so that's why often you know, if you're an employer that's ever been subject to a U.S. DOL uh, wage and hour audit, one of the questions during the audit will be, you know, do you have an FMLA policy? Because the DOL, you know, as long as they're in, you know, with an employer, 
you know, do you have the poster? Do you have a policy? Right. They're going to check on those things. Uh, but, you know, what I would say is that the majority of disputes and cases involving, um, you know, FMLA claims by employees uh, go go into court. Uh, you know, you can certainly that. file a complaint with the Department of Labor. Uh, and likewise, if they're unable to resolve the, the matter with the employee, with the employer, rather, then yeah. the DOL will file a federal lawsuit. Um, so so that, that's how these typically come about. Yeah, I mean, because it's going to probably most commonly originate from a, a disgruntled employee who thought in their mind they got terminated unjustly, unjustly because their job should have been held for them. And the employer probably thinks, well, they left. They, I, I couldn't, I had to replace the job. I had to keep working. So it's probably a situation like that. And then the employee is like, go, goes, gets a lawyer and a uh, lawyer says, no, they're, they, they, they should have held the job. They're, they're an eligible employer. Then it ends up sitting in front of a judge. That's, it, it, am I thinking about that, Brett? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And right. And we're just as likely to see an issue with the reinstatement at the end as we are with issues with providing the leave, right? So if you fail to provide leave at all, right, that would be, you know, an FMLA, FMLA uh, interference claim. So that uh, might sound weird, but the, like when you're talking about, like when I asked the question, where do employers get in trouble the most? You kind of said the starting point is, do they even treat it like potentially FMLA, family medical leave as a leave type? Almost, this is where it might sound weird, but it's almost like, Sexual, you and I did a, a podcast recently on sexual harassment uh, and in specifically on investigations when there's a harassment claim, right? And just right. if you're sitting in front of the judge, there's plenty of gray area whether you were or weren't liable, what you did or didn't do to contribute and to prevent and blah, blah, blah. But you signal an awful lot to a judge how serious you take the investigation when the complaint first presents itself, right? If you can demonstrate to the judge that, hey, you know, they, they came to me. This is immediately what we did. We sequestered the people. We put in a full investigation. The judge is going to look at that favorably, whether whether you win or lose the case. Probably same here, right? If if someone yes. is suing you for FMLA leave and you're like, hey, as soon as they came to me, we got a legal opinion. I looked at how many hours they were. Here's our records. And we made a determination that they that this wasn't a qualifying event. That looks a hell of a lot different than saying, I don't know that, you know, we just, you know, they, they left and that's, that's their, that's their choice. Right. I mean, the judge is going to view those two cases very, very differently. Yeah. Mike, you're a hundred percent on point. And in fact, this is actually a statutory, it's in the statute. So, uh, you know, what, what, what the issue becomes is that if an employer's violation of the FMLA is willful, then not a, that does a couple of things. One it extends the statute of limitations from two years to three years, <laughs> meaning that an employee then has three years to file a claim instead of two. And in addition, it leads to the imposition of liquidated damages. This is starting to sound a lot like the FLSA, right? Where the liquidated damages will essentially be equal to the amount of back pay and interest uh, that the employee is entitled to. So it, it doubles their damages unless the employer can show it acted in good faith um, and had a reasonable grounds to comply that it believed it complied with the FMLA. So, you know, that's why it's so important. You know, as I said, just the beginning step of understanding if you're a company that this applies to, because look, it's hard to get everything right. A hundred percent of the time, you know, in handling FMLA leave designations, a company might get things wrong, you know, from time to time it can happen. And again, if the company goes through the right process, but for some odd reason, you know, makes an incorrect uh, designation, you know, that may not lead to liquidated damages or in a finding of willfulness. But if you're an employer that doesn't even get the process started because you just don't even believe you're subject to FMLA and, you know, you don't even have a policy or, you know, you don't even get started with inquiring about, you know, the leave and whether it qualifies, that sh that surely is going to be, uh, you know, willful and expose the company to greater damages. So exactly as you said. So give, give an employers the benefit of the doubt here. 
the reason they may not start, I, I can see all kinds of scenarios playing out in people's minds, right? Um, you know, I, I don't think the problem in, in the country is employers that are, uh, you know, finding ways to, to take advantage of the little man. I don't think that, I, I think it's just ignorance uh, of, of what the law is. And I could see employers thinking, oh, well, they say they need to take leave because they need to take care of so-and-so. Well, I know them. They're not even close to that person. They're just using this as an excuse to get out of work, right? Or um, uh, they have to take a leave because they have some medical condition and you're like, oh, that person is always sick. They're, I mean, they're, they're, they're faking it. Maybe they're right. Maybe they are even faking it, but they're, they're starting to play the role of doctor. Mm-hmm. Can Can you... Can you give us some rails around what are the types? I want to get deeper on the on the qualifying reasons for leave. So let's let's start with a fa- taking care of a family member. Mm. If it's taking care of uh, a spouse, a parent, or a child, that seems black and white until you end up in today's world of blended families. That uh, maybe what if it's a stepchild? What if it's um, uh, not a legally binding child, but it's someone you li- really do take care of. What if it's an aunt, not a grandma, but it's the aunt who raised you. And so she really, for you is your grandma. Can, can you take us through some of those edge cases? Yeah, absolutely. So no, you, you hit on some good points there. So spouse is limited to the person whom an individual is married to uh, as recognized under state law. And so this is, again, right, a simple thing like spouse, it becomes a little complicated, right? Because not all states in the U.S., for instance, allow, um, you know, certain types of marriages. So the, what the law, what the FMLA says is if you were married in a state that permitted that marriage, right, whatever the marriage is, then that's a spouse, right? It doesn't matter if you then move to a state that would not, you know, permit that type of marriage. You are married because you, you are spouses because you got married in a state that permitted it. Um, so that you know, includes, you know, same sex marriage. But for instance, this does not cover, uh, you know, uh, domestic partners. So a domestic partner would not be considered a spouse. Um, yeah. Then we go to child, and I, 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 I swear you, I, I think you are reading from you know the, the definitions here, but uh, you know a, a child, right? So that can be a biological child, it can be an adopted or foster child, uh, it can be a stepchild, as you mentioned, uh, it can be someone uh, you know in loco parentis. So you know that means right your your example of you know, an aunt who has basically raised this child as their own, they're responsible for the child, right? They, they would be considered, uh, the person would be considered a child of that person because, you know, that individual has assumed the role of caring for the child, even if there's not a biological relationship. How about siblings? Adult siblings, is that qualify? No, so that, that does not qualify uh, siblings. Um, they were so going my, with- so I'm 55, my 56 year old sister got cancer. Mm-hmm. I couldn't take FMLA to go care for her. Right. Likely not. However, you know, look, sometimes, you know, we have siblings who for, you know, have certain circumstances where, you know, you as their sibling might take over the role for caring for them and become their, you know, they become their, your legal ward. Right. And so, okay. There could be situations like that where it could come under that, but absent some formality like that, um, just the general concept of, hey, I need to take care of, you know, a sibling of mine, um, not, not qual, you know, that doesn't come under FMLA. So, so without trying to uncover every single uh, edge case here, is it safe to say, Brian, that employers should be thinking about this? It's, it's parent spouse, children, and as long as you have, as long as that employee, you know, has anything that even feels plausible, you, you, you shouldn't be putting your judgment on, oh, you know, they, they're they saying that it was their aunt who raised them, but that doesn't qualify. You should just err in the judgment. That, that you, you should err, err to the side of the employee's opinion that if they claim it's somebody who's their parent, 
their spouse or their child probably dangerous thin thin ice to be treading on as an employer to to play the role of doctor or lawyer in determining whether that really is a qualifying event or a, 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 an eligible case give them their fmla you don't have to pay them right you're just protecting that job but uh it, it, it's those three it's not cousins it's not siblings it's not best friend who feels like family it's parent spouse child right right yeah exactly and, and you're right it, you know we have those definitions but then you know look some i've seen some employers you know get into the weeds on well what does caring for that person mean and i'm going to inquire as to exactly what they're doing to care for them because i think they're just sitting on a couch and watching tv all day um and look you know FMLA abuse exists and there are ways we uh, can uh, crack down on it. But here, caring for a family member, it's generally going to be easily satisfied. If that person has a serious, if the family member has a serious health condition, you're clearly going to be caring with them. It's, you know, spending time with them to arrange, you know, doctor's visits, handle their, you know, medical needs, um, you know, and and even just the uh, act of, offering psychological comfort to a family member who's already receiving care, right? That's caring for them. So yeah, agreed that, you know, employers should not, you know, you want to confirm, you know, who it is, but this is typically not one of the elements that, you know, an employer should really, uh, you know, be looking over with a fine tooth comb, right? There, there are other areas that are, you know, um, lend themselves some more abuse than, than this specific concept. Hey, Brian, why don't we wrap with maybe just some practical guidance? So if you're an employer that does not have, maybe you've got some copy paste stuff in an employee handbook, but you haven't deeply thought about your FMLA policy. Uh, what, what would be your practical guidance for employers setting up an FMLA policy and a plan to review and administer when claims present themselves? Yeah. So... Yeah, first off, yeah, absolutely. A company should, there, there are a couple things, right, that an employer should do, right? There's a required notice that should be posted. So that's an easy one, right? We get our postings out. Um, mm -hmm. And then, right, there are some other forms, but yeah, an FMLA policy that goes in the handbook or is a standalone, that is an absolute no brainer. Right. So you, first thing you're doing, posting a copy of the FMLA notice, you can go to the Department of Labor's website to get that. And then second, you're developing this handbook section. Right. And it's going to go through a lot of what we've discussed today. Right. It should explain how employees can determine their eligibility and how they request leave under the F M FMLA. Right. The timing of it, who they make the request to. Um, you know, and, you know, you talk about the medical certification that I discussed, right? You're going to say a medical certification is required, you know, to be completed by your healthcare provider. Um, you know, in addition, it'll have consequences for the employee failing to get the company information, right? Because that's just as important that, you know, to notify employees that if you don't get us information for us to make this uh, eligibility determination, then you're not going to get FMLA leave uh, or it's going to be delayed until you get us that information. So we want to put that out there, too. Um, and then obviously a big key we've touched on it is a statement saying how you know, leave will be handled you know, upon you know, reinstatement. Right. Their reinstatement rights um, and you know, conversely, the consequences of failing to return uh, after 12 weeks of leave. And I think I, I just want to get into that for one moment because that is a, an area where I see employers get tripped up, where they look at FMLA in a vacuum, where they say, all right, we've given you 12 weeks. Now, at the end of the 12 weeks, the employee says, I can't return. Let's say it's their own health, serious health condition. You know, the doctor says, I, I need four more weeks. And I've seen employers who say, well, you couldn't return. We're, we're terminating your employment. And that's not the way to go about this, right? Because there are other federal and state laws like the ADA, right? If someone cannot return 
upon the end of their FMLA leave because of a medical condition, they conceivably have may, may need ADA, you know, a disability accommodation, right? A reasonable accommodation could be yeah. an additional four more weeks of leave. Um, so we need to make the, you know, consider those things. And so this return after 12 weeks, they don't always have to return, right? It could also be maybe they come back with some, you know, light, right? With light work instead of, you know, their normal job uh, for some period of time. And that's all kind of, it transfers into the disability accommodation sphere uh, much of the time, you know, after the end of the, uh, the FMLA leave. Got it. Okay. That's a really, really important ad. Um, I get my brain, I think it, so often I, I go to parent, spouse, child, and care and forget about, okay, this, this does count if you're sick or you're out too. And, right. and there, that's the crossover to potential uh, ADA. Right. Do you see, I get, I'm guessing this doesn't happen a ton, but if they are on FMLA for their own medical condition, the intent of FMLA is that you protect that job. But if you're no longer capable of doing that job, where does the ADA start and the ADA stop? Because maybe you require a reasonable accommodation and, and maybe I'll just, let's say you, you worked uh, in, in the warehouse and you have in the our job requirement, you had to be able to lift 10 pounds. Uh, 20 pounds over waist high. <clears throat> and now that uh, the doctor releases, you can go back to work, but you, but you, you got to be a desk job. Well, maybe the, you, you held back the, the warehouse job, but you don't even have a desk job available for them. What, are you still obligated under FMLA as it relates to the transition to ADA? Yep. So great, great point. And so this is why you know, it's not necessary, but I, I think it, it's definitely something we would recommend that uh, before an employee is going to return from FMLA, and again, this is only when it's the employee's seri own serious health condition, would be you want to require them to get a fitness for duty, uh, you know, documentation, you know, from their medical provider to provide to you that certifies that, yeah, they can do the job. And so, again, this goes back, we need a job description that's going to talk about the essential functions of the job so that the medical provider can provide their opinion as to whether this person can come back, you know, without any restrictions or, right, they you get a fitness for duty letter that says this employee can return but has these restrictions. And then, right, then it completely goes into the disability accommodation uh, framework and we're okay. you know, determining if that's a reasonable accommodation, if there's undue hardship. Um, of course, we don't have to create new positions for people, but if there is an open position that you know, is slightly different, that you know, would, would fit these restrictions and the employees you know, agreeing to that, then, you know, that that would be a, a way to go there. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're I, I think that's why it's always good. And this goes even beyond FMLA. But whenever an employee is on some type of disability related leave, you need to get a note from the doctor's provider before uh, from the medical provider before they come back to confirm what restrictions, if any, they have. Right. Otherwise, you know, you, you can, you know, wind up having a whole host of uh, issues at that point. This is maybe an, uh, I'm feeling two future podcasts for you and I. I mean, there's, we could do an ADA in and of itself. Obviously, that's a, it's a really, really big topic, but we could spend an hour there. We could probably spend darn near an hour just on this FMLA to ADA bridge topic. This is interesting. This is something I haven't really thought of. Yeah. Yeah, and it comes up more than you think. I mean, obviously, there are lots of FMLA leaves that don't implicate the employee's uh, medical condition, right? It's others. And so that's not, you know, it doesn't always come up in that uh, vein. But yeah, I mean, look, many FMLA leaves are for the employee's own uh, health condition. And yeah, you know, they're, they're not always ready to come back in 12 weeks or they are, but there's restrictions. And so... You know, again, that that's where an employer, 
if they, you know, if they look at this in a vacuum, as I said before, they might think they're complying with the law because, hey, you couldn't come back in 12 weeks. Sorry, we don't have to any more FMLA leave to give you. But right, there's you know, short term disability. There's you know, reasonable accommodations for disabilities, a whole host of things that, you know, could be implicated in, in that return to work. Yeah, right. Brian, anything else you want to leave us uh, on the topic of FMLA before we wrap? No, I, I think my my last piece of advice with employers would be don't be don't feel overwhelmed if the discussion today of the requirements and obligations, uh, you know, seem you know burdensome. It's this is a process that you can really set up with a check the box and go from one step to another and use certain forms. And so, uh, you know, what I would really suggest is you know, investing in the compliance now and that it'll pay off. Yes, you're still going to have questions. There will still be some situations where you might need to you know, speak to an HR consultant at, an, at uh, a shore for guidance. But without the basic framework, you could very well end up being one of those employers that isn't even, you know, deeming employees eligible who are entitled to take FMI leave. And, and that that's a really bad place to be in. So a little, I, a little, I think, you start, I think you started the conversation today saying that this is simpler than it seems. And I think we just proved in the last hour that it's not, it's, it's <laughs> the concept pretty simple. Um, and I'd say it's probably not 80%, it's probably 90, 95% of cases are typical. Uh, but where employers get in trouble is around the edges and most importantly, not taking it serious, right? Exactly. Yeah. Brian, thanks. I always enjoy our conversations and thanks to everybody else for joining today. Uh, if you got value from today's program, uh, I encourage you to like, comment, and share. Uh, consume this podcast on any platform you choose, including YouTube. Uh, and until next week, we'll talk to you later. Thanks, Brian. That's it for this episode of Mission to Grow. Thanks for joining us today. For show notes and more episodes, visit us at missiontogrow.com. If you found this content valuable, I invite you to share it with a friend and subscribe to the show. If you really want to help, I'd love it if you left a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen. Mission to Grow is sponsored by Assure. Assure helps more than 100,000 businesses get access to capital, stay compliant, and develop the talent they need to grow. To learn more about how Assure can help your business grow, visit assuresoftware.com. Until next time.